lectures. Um, so the first speaker of today is uh, Vishweshwa uh, Guttal, uh, who is giving the second lecture on uh, instability in uh, uh, and stochasticity in ecological dynamics. So please, Vishu, share the screen when you are ready. You. Okay, hold on for a second. Uh, I don't see the screen shared yet. Okay. Do you see my. Okay, no, hold on. I think I made a mistake. One second. Is it fine now? Can you see my slides? I see the slides. Excellent. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, so welcome back, everyone. Um, so yesterday, Simon gave a very broad overview that incidentally included uh, uh, ideas of bistability, tipping points, and also early warning signals. Uh, so, uh, so I'm sort of going to continue on those themes today, uh, as I as I had mentioned in the first talk. So, I have this this is the plan for the three talks I have. So, I have sort of uh, sort of talked about basic bistable dynamics. Uh, resilience and tipping points, and how can we anticipate these using the ideas of early warning signals? And then today, the main focus will be on spatial models. You know, the, everything I spoke on the last talk assumed actually there was no reference to space. All the mathematical techniques I used was basically simple, ordinary differential equations uh, with some noise superimposed on it in an ad hoc way. So, but today, uh, let us look at what happens if there is space. You know, how do we understand bistable systems? Basically, the sort of one one question that one can try to, which I try to focus on today, would be: Can spatial patterns in ecosystems be used to infer resilience of ecosystems? That's the main question I'm going to ask. The so the the, the last one, which I'm hoping uh, will be as planned, will be to look at. Okay, so today I'll just do a brief recap. I'm going to go over this somewhat quickly before I move into the tipping points, right? So, uh, so I give this example of large scale continental shift. That is a classic example. This is not the only one. There are many other examples of uh, ecosystems for gradual changes in the driver. Okay, and of course, this has been observed in many, many, many systems. And now, to my own list of uh, Simon added a whole bunch of other systems yesterday in his talk. So how do we, so here is was a simple uh, ecosystem model I uh, demonstrated. The first term in this ecosystem model where V, v represents the sort of total biomass density in the, in the system actually comprises the classic ecological model which is logistic growth to which we add a grazing term which is sort of, you know, which could be intrinsic to the system. It could also be extrinsic such as livestock grazing. Okay, so this is a nonlinear term, and interestingly, the once you add this, and for a whole range of parameter values, you get a bistability. There is a region of this grazing rate uh, for which two alternative stable states exist, and uh, and uh, the which state current. And, and there could be these switches, shifts, critical transitions, tipping points, abrupt changes are these two points, which are uh, critical points or the bifurcation points of, the, of this simple model. So the question, you know, the nice thing about this simple model was that we could think of the dynamics of ecosystems with bistability as a ball rolling in this landscape. So for example, the minima in these landscapes correspond to uh, 
correspond to the stable branches in the bifurcation diagram. So depending on the initial condition, the system could be either in this state or this state. And, uh, and this, uh, you know, this helps us understand concepts of base enough attraction and resilience. And you know, this concept of potentials was not just for heuristics. It was also useful for arriving at, uh, you know, arriving at uh, quantitative metrics that helps us make some forecasts about tipping points. For example, if the system is far away from the critical point, as in this, the leftmost uh, point here, these potentials are symmetric. Whereas when you're very close to the tipping points, potentials are shallow with a low curvature and asymmetric. And this led to the phenomenon of critical slowing down and asymmetric fluctuations. Uh, critical slowing down means that systems take now longer to return back to the equilibrium. They exhibit more fluctuations and they also exhibit asymmetric fluctuations. Put these things together, we could uh, you know, come up with some metrics from the time series uh, and that could actually forecast. In this example, we found that if the system were to undergo a transition at this point, if we had this time series uh, before the thousand time minutes, if we could, if I could calculate simple quantities like autocorrelation at lag one, this measures the critical slowing down. It's increasing with time as one is approaching a critical point or the abrupt transition. Standard deviation, a measure of fluctuation is increasing. The skewness, the strength of skewness, again, which is a measure of asymmetry in fluctuation is also increasing. Okay, now these metrics, so if you had no, you know, if you were somewhere around uh, 800 or the 900 time limit, so these combined metrics give us a hint that uh, the system might be going towards a tipping point. So that's the sort of, you know, summary of where we were. I also spoke to you about how uh, there have been many empirical studies, experimental studies, field studies. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work. As I also showed you, when there is huge amount of stochasticity, uh, you know, some of these uh, classic signatures can be masked. Okay, so now, uh, so now, of course, ecosystems are really spatial, right? Now they also exhibit really fascinating patterns. Uh, these are, you know, uh, some of the classic examples of the fairy rings uh, found in African deserts. And these are again, you know, patches of labyrinthine patterns of vegetation. And, uh, and then, you know, one can go on. There are more types of vegetation. Many of these vegetation patterns are often found in resource constrained uh, uh, systems or systems which actually have a relatively higher amount of ecological stress. So therefore this sort of prompted many people to think, can these spatial patterns provide some signatures of uh, abrupt regime shifts that might happen in the future. So this is an example of clustering in the muscles, muscles, uh, and, and this is an example of clustering of vegetation on the seabed. So there are many, many examples, plenty of examples. So now to understand these kind of state systems, there are three classic approaches. One is called, uh, so the first two of them are actually both reaction diffusion systems. However, the distinction between the first and second comes from the fact that in the first system, there are no regular patterns. There are no patterning in the ecosystem. Systems sort of roughly appear as homogeneous. There are second class of uh, systems are regular patterning systems. And you may have heard of Turing patterns. Um, okay, and, uh, and the third class of systems are, there are patterns, there is self-organization, but there is no periodicity or regularity to these patterns. So there are these three types of spatial ways to think about ecosystem by stability. So I'm going to go one by one and see how we can you know, do theory of these systems. How can we come up with uh, these early warning indicators followed by you know, testing them systems as well. The action diffusion system and to think of spatial system, reaction diffusion system with no patterns. So what do I mean by that? Okay, by the way, before I go further, uh, I want to emphasize that, uh, just one second, my internet seems to be fluctuating a bit, I'll see what happens. 
Misho, also the connection is a little bit uh, disturbed, so. Uh -huh. One second, I'll just, are you able to hear me clearly? Yeah, sometimes it, uh, sometimes not. So perhaps it's better to remove the video. Uh, oh, okay, I will, I will stop my video. Right uh, send video. Yeah, I'll stop. Uh, one second. I have to unshare this for a second. Sorry. Okay, the my connection. Yeah, there's some. Yeah, it does say it's a bit slow. Uh, okay, I'll stop my video. I'll share the slide again. Okay. Okay. Huh. So, uh, so some of the many of the points I'm going to make today. They are actually nicely summarized in this uh, paper that uh, many of us uh, who work in this area came together and wrote a review article. So, uh, so this is a reference you can refer to to get a summary of the theoretical principles uh, behind uh, spatial patterns and how we can use to use spatial patterns to infer resilience. Okay, so how do we go about this? Okay, let's go back to the same model I showed you. I showed you this model where there was this uh, simple logistic uh, growth term followed by a nonlinear grazing term. So I'm going to assume the same term as a local reaction term, meaning in space, locally, exactly the same processes are happening. There's a local carrying capacity and a local grazing rate. Of course, the grazing rate can have some stochasticity in it, which is represented by this eta C term with, as a Gaussian white noise. And then we add, uh, a spatial coupling term where uh, the idea that you know typically diffuse seed dispersal, which is a mechanism by which you know one of the one of the key mechanisms by which spatial uh, interactions happen is uh, modeled by a simple diffusion term. So the what diffusion term does basically intuitively is it spreads things out in you know in uh, in space. Uh, so this is the model I'm going to use. As you do know, the mean field part of this. If there was no diffusion, if I did not have the diffusion, this system will show the same bifurcation diagram by stability. And, uh, and for a, even when there is diffusion under a bunch of conditions, this continues to be hold. This continues to hold true. But of course, you know, there are some many subtle aspects once you add space. I'm assuming those are not in play here. So this is what we showed using a combination of numerical simulations and also uh, analytical calculations. So I'm not going to show uh, analytical calculations. So these are actually stochastic nonlinear PDEs, right? Uh, there are methods uh, borrowed from the statistical physics literature that we can use to compute the same things I'm going to show you today, but I'm going to focus only on the numerical simulations. So what we have done here is, you know, over a period of time, we run these simulations and then we sort of you know, stress this ecosystem more and more over time by increasing this grazing parameter C. So by increasing this grazing parameter C slowly over time, we find that a vegetated system becomes a completely bare area, okay? So and that happens over a period of, let's say 52 years on the time scale that we chose in this model. So let's look at the top graph here. What this shows is the average biomass density. If you were to do a spatial mean of all the vegetation density, you find that it hacks, it goes, it sort of gradually decays. And then by year 48 or so, it suddenly undergoes sort of a rapid shift downwards and settle down to a very low biomass density uh, region. So we plot spatial variance and spatial skewness for these spatial images. So what we basically do is for every, imagine every instant of time, we are computing spatial variance, uh, which is basically variance of all the uh, data available in, in, in a spatial image. Likewise, spatial skewness is the skewness of all the data available for a given image. So earlier it was uh, computed over time. Now we are computing over space. So if you plot this, what you find interestingly is that even before this nonlinear shift in the mean value happens, there is a dramatic increase, sort of, you know, you know, sort of, you know close to tenfold increase in the value of spatial variance. Likewise, the skewness 
actually increases from a value of close to zero all the way to one and even begins to turn downwards even before the mean value has shown any significant trends. Uh, one can do these calculations uh, again and show that even spatial correlation, the third plot here below, also shows similar patterns. So basically the, the message here is that increase in spatial variance and spatial skewness, increase in spatial autocorrelations. And also uh, what I have not shown you here is that even in the spectral properties, uh, which sort of you know, relate to both correlation and the variance, they also increase. All of these quantities increase much more rapidly than the spatial mean value alone would increase. So therefore, we can use these as indicators, early warning signals uh, in spatial ecological systems, which do not have spatial patterns, okay? So that provides a theoretical background of you know, how the base, same ideas of time series variance, skewness, autocorrelations can also be sort of you know, nicely transformed into, uh, you know, can be applied to spatial systems. Uh, now that's the theory, you know, how do you test this in an empirical world? Uh, we, you know, what do we need, especially if you have an empirical system that you really want to apply to a large scale ecosystem, how do you do this? So we need three things to be able to do that, right? One is that I need an ecosystem that has undergone a transition, okay? And then secondly, I need to have spatial data over time at sufficient spatial and temporal resolution for this system. Finally, it turns out that there are very few or I'm not aware of any such data available. At least, you know, five, five years ago when I was looking, there was no such clean data available. So what do we do? Okay, so here is an idea. You know, how do we test this theory? Even when you don't have, you know, such an ecosystem that has undergone regime shift or abrupt transition over a period of time, we don't have such a data. What, what best can we do? You know, I told you the theory, right? You know, we have this uh, state variable as a function of time. We need snapshots over time. And then we measure these metrics, for example. Imagine that instead of snapshots over time, I had snapshots over space. So the x-axis is not time anymore. It's now either space or the driver values, okay? Uh, so this is actually an idea called space for time substitution. And it is widely used in the ecology sort of uh, field studies. For example, if you want to understand how shifting temperatures change species compositions. How do species ranges change? One idea that a lot of field ecologists use is, of course, you can't wait for 100 years for the climate change to happen. What you do is you look along temperature gradients, altitudinal gradients, where you can find temperature gradients, and then use that space for time substitution to sort of infer or forecast what might happen in the future if the temperature were to change. So, so we use the same idea. If we have an ecosystem that goes from one state to other state as a function of space, can I compute these indicators and do they show expected patterns? So indeed it turns out that we, there are such ecosystems. So this is an example of the very famous Serengeti Mara ecosystem in uh, Kenya and Tanzania. And uh, what you find in this ecosystem is the central area is sort of uh, predominantly a grassland. However, the peripheral areas on the, you know, um, is actually a woodland ecosystem. Okay, so we ask the following question. If you now go from the central grassland areas towards uh, the peripheral uh, woodland areas, if you could think of this as space for time substitution, uh, do you find uh, signatures of, uh, you know, these early warning signals as measured by spatial variance, skewness, outer correlation, and so on, as you go from one end to the other end of the ecosystem. Okay, so, so we chose this very high resolution data at 30 meters, and then we classified each pixel of 30 meters um, as either wood or grass. And then remind, remind you, the scale here is some, you know, we are really talking about a few hundred kilometers by few hundred kilometers data. This is really a huge data set. Okay, so what we do is uh, 
uh, find the relationship between vegetation and uh, the rainfall in this entire landscape, we find that you know if we, in this landscape the grass cover sort of you know shows a nonlinear relationship with the mean annual rainfall. You no, know, uh, which is sort of you know expected from many savanna forest ecosystems. You know, Carla has spoken about this. Simon has mentioned this. So the data here again supports the same hypothesis. So we find that the grass cover shows this high nonlinear transition as a function of mean annual rainfall. So what we now do is, uh, let me remind you the theoretical expectation. If the mean value of the state variable shows a nonlinear transition, then a spatial variance will increase even before the nonlinearity in the mean begins. Skewness will again increase even before uh, the mean will uh, decrease. Likewise, correlation and the uh, spectral properties. Okay, the black data here, black points here, present the null model, uh, just to show you know that you know we are not getting any statistical artifacts. So, in fact, exactly as predicted, we find similar patterns in our data. So, even before the nonlinearity in the variance, have, you know, in the mean has begun, variance has increased quite dramatically. Skewness spatial autocorrelation and uh, low frequency spectra and likewise we find this across many other uh, many other uh, transits i showed you there so sort of you know this provides uh, an evidence that you know um, uh, one can use these uh, you know mathemat you know ideas derived from nonlinear dynamical systems and models and apply it to a uh, messy real world ecosystem Okay, so that uh, sort of, you know, gives one example of how we can use spatial models of ecosystem by stability in reaction diffusion systems, you know, patterns. So let me now move on to regular patterning systems. Uh, reg regular patterning systems are also called Turing pattern systems. And uh, here are some really uh, beautiful examples. I'm not going to cover a whole lot of this. Again, I showed you some picture earlier. Um, there are many, many parts of the natural world we, we refine very nice regular periodic patterns. And these are often modeled by a mechanism called a Turing mechanism, where there is a very short range positive feedback. And then there is a you know, an immediate uh, lo long range uh, negative feedback. So this combination of local positive, short range positive feedback and a longer range negative feedback uh, causes these patterns to persist. And uh, this paper in science argued that these patterns may actually uh, provide some indication of a catastrophic shift. So look at this uh, picture here. Look at this sort of, you know, uh, diagram. So what this shows is there is a region of bistability here. Again, the region of bistability. As you move along this act, region of bistability, uh, the spatial patterns are changing. So, so Reed Kirk and Quoth has argued that these changes in the, these uh, spatial patterns may offer some hints about the resilience of ecosystem. However, there are other studies that sort of contest this to show that there are so many types of these patterns and the, and the nonlinearity and uh, uh, stochasticity can sort of uh, influence and, you know, um, uh, confirmed our interpretations. Nevertheless, uh, but this is a very interesting idea that spatial pattern can actually offer some signatures of resilience. So now the third type of spatial patterns are not, are slightly different. Look at these pictures. So the, if you look at these pictures, you know, these two have some regularity in the spacing between vegetation, likewise this. However, if you look at this, you know, this cluster is much bigger than this cluster, than this cluster, and then this cluster. So what you basically see, is, see here is that there are a, there's a whole range of vegetation sizes, cluster sizes that are possible. Uh, and this basically gave, led to a whole class of new models and new studies that uh, found some very interesting results. For example, in this paper, uh, uh, Scanlon et al, including Simon Levin, they showed, they found that if you quantify these patch sizes, vegetation patch sizes, 
And if you look at the probability density functions, they show a power law. So power law basically is a uh, very interesting pattern because power law often indicates that uh, there is no um, well-defined mean and variance, which in other words, what this means that you can probably find really, really large values of clusters, which are impossible in simple Turing like models. And of course, it's not only uh, in uh, vegetation that people have found such patterns. There are also examples of uh, uh, such power law clusters in mussels, sawgrass, seagrass, and scrubs. Okay. Of course, you know, there is a, let me caution, um, let me add a uh, cautionary tale here by saying that uh, uh, there are many, many studies that also very strongly argue that the in a lot of these studies, um, the, the statistical evidence for existence of power law is really weak. It's something to keep in mind, a very important point. Okay. And, uh, you know, in, in uh, you know, early, you know, th there was, there has been quite a bit of research on understanding where do these power laws come from? Because, you know, when you have a power law nature of any quantity, um, and uh, when the power law exponent belongs to certain ranges, especially if the if that exponent is between one and two, there is the mean value is theoretically infinitely large. Okay, and so is the variance. How, what does that really mean? You know, how do you explain such sort of seemingly unphysical patterns? Um, so, uh, so in physics, there has been a lot of work trying to understand power laws and phys in physics. The basic idea in physics is that uh, whenever there is a phase transition, look at the figure C here, whenever there's a phase transition from one state to other state, at the point of phase transition, the, what's also called critical point, you see certain universal features. As Simon was pointing out, this is a, you know, irrespective of the complexity of the system, otherwise, at the phase transition, uh, the number of degrees of freedom are often often very low. And uh, so a lot of very different types of systems happen to show very similar properties. And one such property is the existence of power loss. So there has been a lot of speculation in complex systems, whether whenever the power loss that we observe in complex systems, such as vegetation systems, ecological systems, and so on, are they indicative of criticality? And this is a whole field in itself, and I'm not going to really touch upon it. I encourage you to sort of read uh, uh, critically on this uh, topic, a uh, very interesting topic. Uh, so uh, what I, I'm going to now focus more on the mechanisms. How is it that some vegetation ecosystems show irregular patterns, meaning the cluster sizes are not a well-defined average value. Uh, on the other hand, there are some other ecosystems where the cluster sizes show very clear periodic patterns, such as Turing patterns. So what's the mechanism that makes them so different? So it turns out that to... Oops. Hello, so can you still hear me? Yes. Ha, huh, because uh, my network said the connection lost. I'm sorry. Yes, okay. for a second. Uh, uh. Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, so, so the question I was trying to address here was, um, you know, how is that ecosystems of similar type show rather different patterns, spatial patterns? So one way to understand that is to look at the net interaction strength. Uh, so here a positive value means a positive feedback. Positive feedback means that the presence of, a, for example, the presence of a, uh, a, a tree will facilitate the presence of another tree nearby. So there is a local positive feedback followed by uh, no net feedback after a distance. So if you have only a local positive feedback, what you often find these are these irregular shape patterns. On the other hand, if you had a local positive feedback, immediately followed by a short range negative feedback, okay? This difference leads to highly regular patterns, which are also called Turing patterns. So therefore, as Simon was pointing out yesterday, when we try to understand spatial patterns, mechanisms become 
really crucially important. So what are the biological processes? And often these are integrated with many geophysical processes such as water that flows in the landscape. Uh, so therefore, ecohydrology plays a very important role in shaping these feedback as well. So, so moving on from these, you know, irregular. So let's go back to the original questions that I set out, which is, can we look at these spatial patterns and then make some inferences about stability? So, so the, in this paper uh, by Sonia Kafi and uh, co-authors, they made this following claim. They said that if you have, a, if you observe a power law scale-free clustering, such an ecosystem is a stable ecosystem. On the other hand, if you observed a, if you observed as, I was trying to see my, on the other hand, if you observe that the, um, if you observe that the cluster sizes are not power law, but if they're exponential, then they are more likely to be um, uh, less resilient. So basically the argument was that you can use the cluster size properties to infer something about the resilience of ecosystems. So to make that point again, what you are seeing here is a uh, example of uh, low, low, low stress system This is to high stressed ecosystem. And what you're seeing here is this power law, which is bending away. Bending away meaning, you know, this is not a power law anymore. So, so these, these parts are likely to represent more stable ecosystem. Whenever you see a power law, a heavy tail distribution, if you find a, a exponential like distribution, this could be a case of a highly resilient ecosystem. So less resilient ecosystem. So uh, you know, um, so sort of you know, to summarize, you know, this idea of how one can use spatial patterns as signatures of tipping points. So I want to emphasize there are three types. You know, first is that of no spatial pattern, right? When there are no spatial patterns, uh, I discussed. I also showed you empirical evidence, and then when you have these uh, periodic patterns, okay. And then you have scale-free patterns. So when you have this no patterning systems, you can use the what we call generic early warning signals, such as you know variance, skewness, and correlations. Those provide early warning signal. When you have periodic pattern, the, the very presence of the nature of the periodicity and this, you know, usually these spotted patterns, they are often thought to be. Uh, may be an indicator that we are very close to critical transitions. On the other hand, when you have systems with irregular patterns, as you move from scale-free pattern to, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know no, not so fat-tailed, uh, thin-tailed distributions, okay, then, then you infer that those systems are less resilient. That's a summary of various theoretical uh, models. So, so far in my, in my understanding, there is a reasonably good evidence that these sorts of indicators work well in real ecosystems. There's quite a bit of debate about these two. And there, are, there have not been too many empirical studies that look at these two. So now let me, let me sort, of, uh, sort of provide a twist or a spin here, uh, basically to sort of show that these results are a lot more tricky and complicated. So for example, in this paper that was uh, led by my PhD student, Sumitra Shankaran, what she showed was that this sort of claim that cluster size distributions are the patch size distributions um, that can provide uh, early warning signal actually have nothing to do with this uh, phenomenon of critical slowing down, which uh, I have already sort of summarized. And in fact, the claim that loss of power law clustering is an indicator is not true. So basically in my, in this so loss of power law clustering is not a generic indicator of ecosystem resilience. So, so in fact, there is a quite a bit of, you know, depending on the model one, that one uses and the mechanism that one incorporates, uh, we can actually show sort of, you know, test the limitations of some of these uh, metrics. So how do we go about doing this? Let me 
Uh, so let me sort of try to describe how we build these simple models. So these are very different type of models. These are not reaction diffusion systems. So we call them, you know, they're popularly known as cellular automata models. So in these cellular automata models, you have, so just one second. So you have, so you sort of assume that the space is divided into a whole large grid, like in the central, uh, central figure here. Okay. And uh, different cells either can be occupied by a, for example, a tree, or it could even be a muscle bed. So tree is only a representative organism here. Um, and uh, it could also be empty. So it could basically be one, you know, we represent occupied cells as one and others as zero. And then you sort of implement certain stochastic update rules. For example, uh, let's say if we uh, choose this, the, this pair of a, a tree and an unoccupied area next to each other. So two possibilities happen. So one is that of death. So there is a probability of death here. And then there's a probability of birth here. For example, you can see that in this case, if this arrow is chosen in the simulation, this original tree has been, is now dead. On the other hand, if the birth was chosen, you know, there is now an addition of tree here. So there could be a birth event or a death event. Likewise, there could be additional complex interactions. So these are called facilitation or positive feedback interaction. For example, if we choose the update for a pair of trees, which are next to each other, two things can happen. One of them can die, like this happened here. So of the two here, one of them has died. On the other hand, the two together will facilitate birth of another tree nearby, okay? And they happen with another set of probabilities, okay? So now we can convert all these sort of intuitive rules of how birth and death happens in, um, in probabilistic terms and uh, depending on the neighborhood, okay? So, uh, um, and, uh, so and in these type of models, typically, there are many, many, many parameters. Uh, for example, uh, in many of the papers I was showing you earlier, often there are five to 10 parameter values. And those large number of parameter values make it very hard to understand what parameter is causing what effect. So in contrast, in this model, what we have done is we have chosen a very simple model inspired by statistical physics that has only two parameter values. One is P. P represents basically local birth rate, as I demonstrated here, or even local death rate. P controls the baseline, the production and death rate. Q controls the strength of facilitation, how a plant will influence the birth and death of plants nearby. So there are two parameters and therefore, because there are just two parameters in this simple model, one can sort of do uh, an extensive set of simulations and find out what happens. So what we then have done with these type of models is do simulate, simulate them for a very large uh, amount of time. So for example, I'm just showing you two representative simulations here. Hand side, you're seeing a simulation for, I, mean, I don't remember the exact parameter values now, they're probably uh, low P and low Q. Okay, on the other hand, I if I'm right here, on the right side, we have kept the value of P, which is the baseline birth rate, same as the previous one. However, we have a much higher value of Q, which is high positive feedback. So, so now we can very easily control two parameter values and then see the effect. So you can already see very clearly in this uh, simple simulation that all else being equal, increasing positive feedback increases clustering in these ecosystems, okay? So therefore one can study how the clustering properties change as a function of uh, positive feedback values. So here is the so, so classic phase diagram. So what we do here in this case is consider two cases, Q is equal to zero represents a case when there is no, 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 no facilitation. 
So in this case, you find that as you vary this driver value P, which is the baseline birth rate, uh, the system undergoes a phase transition from a bare steady state, which means everyone is dead on the entire spatial landscape. And there's a continuous phase transition to a vegetated state or also called active phase in the, uh, in the physics uh, literature. And the crucial point here is this phase transition is a continuous phase transition. On the other hand, look at the value with a uh, large value of uh, 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 positive uh, uh, feedback. Uh, you find that the response of the ecosystem to reducing value of the driver value is highly nonlinear. Look at this, for a very small range of P, the, the steady state density drops fairly nonlinearly, sharply. And in fact, there is actually a gap. There's actually a jump for extremely tiny values of driver values. So this shows an example of how positive feedback in space affects the abrupt regime shifts. And uh, so unlike the sort of, you know, phenomenological model I showed you in the previous uh, uh, talk, so this is an example of a spatially explicit model where uh, one can incorporate some realistic features and mimic features of bistability. So again, this would be uh, the region of, so in this model, the region of bistability would be roughly this much also it's not very clearly shown here. And using this model, what we do is the following, you know, we do simulations and then, you know, from the simulations like this, uh, we calculate at steady state, what are all the different clusters? What are the cluster sizes? And what are the statistics of cluster sizes? So I'm going to show you one result from that right now. So what we have done here is, you know, just uh, assume that we have chosen a value of P, which is in the middle of this phase diagram, continuous phase transition, which is low positive feedback. So I have chosen a system far from uh, the critical point zero here. And then you find that at this point, there is a power law in the cluster sizes. Okay, so this much simpler model than the previous ones can also reproduce existence of power law uh, in in the ecosystems. What we also find is that when the, when the positive feedback is high, you can find these power laws even at the point of critical threshold here. So this is, I know, so this is the parameter value for this graph here corresponds to uh, the exact parameter value where the system will abruptly collapse. And you find that you find a power law there. So what this basically means is some of the previous claims such as cluster size distribution can be used as uh, how far or how resilient the ecosystem is really not robust. For example, I'm finding the same power law distribution. Of course, the exponents are different, only marginally. Exponents are different. And uh, yet this, in this case, the system is really far from the threshold, right? However, in this case, this time is quite close to the threshold. So one can find the same cluster size distributions irrespective of how far or how close you are to ecosystem. And what really matters is the positive feedback. So positive feedback is important. Mechanisms are important. So depending on the values of the, sorry, uh, suddenly my slides went away. So depending on the value of positive feedback, uh, we can find, uh, sorry, my, my uh, my tablet is behaving a bit awkwardly, so maybe I shouldn't do that. How, how do I raise this? There must be some option to erase. Yeah, I don't know if this the annot I guess it's not the annotation of Zoom. Otherwise, you have to go to annotate clear. It's called. Okay, I'll come back. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, so, you know, power law in the cluster sizes, therefore, is a, not a good measure. However, um, you know, there are other types of power laws that do emerge at the, you know, at the, at the point of phase transition. Unfortunately, the resolution of this figure is a bit um, unsatisfactory. Uh, but what you're really seeing here is uh, a measure of correlations, spatial correlations. Basically, what this means is that, um, you know, how perturbations 
in space or correlated uh, across the entire landscape. What we find is that typically at the critical thresholds, uh, a correlation have, there are very, very long range correlations in ecosystems. And, and this manifests often as a power law in the correlation function or the power spectrum. So therefore, those could be used as indicators of uh, proximity to critical points. So in fact, we now have a manuscript that is currently being uh, written up where we find some empirical evidence, some supporting evidence. I wouldn't say very conclusive, but something consistent with this theory. Okay, so basically sort of, you know, if I have to uh, sort of uh, summarize these spatial patterns are fascinating, mechanisms matter. Therefore, however, the interpretation of the resilience from the patterns alone are subtle. One cannot naively use the patterns to make interpretations. So the, so uh, for example, if there one by, by either by looking at the, the nature of patchiness or the cluster size distributions, we have shown in our papers that some of the previous simulation studies uh, were probably finding a uh, set of parameters where it seemed to have worked, but it's not really a re general result. So, uh, so this, uh, so with that uh, sort of you know uh, demonstration of various uh, uh, simulational results, let me sort of briefly allude to what kind of analytical techniques are can be used in these studies. So unfortunately, uh, I'm not going to go into much detail. So for example, we can take the, the, space, the cellular automata model I have uh, described. One can write down a mean field approximation. And the mean field approximation makes a very nice set of uh, predictions about existence of uh, uh, critical, uh, you know, critical points, whether the phase transition is continuous or discontinuous. It often underestimates the values of positive feedback one needs to find a discontinuous phase transition. One can also do something called a stochastic demographic approximation. Again, I'm not going to go into these details. I'm just going to mention to you. And you know, I would, uh, if any of you are interested uh, more in this, uh, feel free to get in touch with me. I will be happy to share some of uh, 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 our own labs as well as you know more general uh, uh, manuscripts that sort of describes these methods. So basically there are a whole variety of methods one can use. So cl classically the idea of a mean field approximation is that we have a well-connected system and I'm looking at a deterministic uh, up, up, you know, limit where again, the number of uh, uh, sites are infinitely large, the number of individuals are infinitely large. However, we know that uh, real ecosystems have finite numbers. How can we, know the effect of those finite numbers. So to do that, it's something called a finite size expansion, which is a very powerful technique. And uh, there are methods of methods called fokker planck equation, Langevin equation, using which one can find the steady state uh, distributions. Uh, okay, so often in this uh, approximation, you don't have a deterministic equation of this type. What you have is a stochastic differential equation of this type. And uh, the stochastic differential equation would then need to be solved using the methods of focal plank equation and Langevin equations. And uh, in some cases, the stochastic differential equations can also capture the effect of the system sizes that you are considering. So I'm not going to go into any further details of this. Uh, so I'm coming to sort of end of my talk. So a lot of the work I presented from my lab today was done by these two PhD students. They have finished their PhDs now. Uh, a really uh, very, very fabulous work done by them. And then uh, also many, many collaborators, in particular Sonia Kefi and her students, Alex and Miguel. And of course, you know, there are many, many more collaborators and funding that has uh, made this work possible. Uh, in particular, Amit, Ashwin and Stephanie and Ed Option, they were all involved in some of the work I presented today. Uh, and uh, so finally, uh, before uh, before I take any question, as I had mentioned, so I'm going to talk about intrinsic noise and bistability in collectives. So that's the sort of you know prelude to tomorrow's talk. How we can actually use similar ideas of noise and bistability, and and how noise has some very counterintuitive effects uh, when we study uh, collectives, not of plants and trees, but instead of 
you know, animals. So I'm now happy to take questions. I think we have uh, quite a bit of time. So I'm happy to go into details of anything that I have sort of skipped over. So there are uh, a few questions in the chat, which uh, I read uh, sure. for you. Uh, I, also try to... I just to remind that if anyone wants to ask a question, please use the- Oh, quite a bit of, I should have seen this uh, midway through, sorry. Okay. Uh, so it doesn't pop up on my window when somebody chats. Sorry? Okay, so go ahead with the questions, please, yeah. Yes, yes. So I, I was just saying that if anyone wants to ask a question about, I mean, can use the Raisin tool. So I'm gonna start reading the question. So the um, one question from Tuan is, so there is no universality for specially correlated systems found in ecology in general? Um, so is there no universality for spatially correlated? It's a tough question. I'm going, I can only give a lousy answer. Um, uh, so clearly, you know, uh, there are many common principles uh, and common patterns, right? You know, you look at uh, zebra code patterns or uh, these, uh, some of the patterns I showed you in the beginning, right? For example, uh, sorry, if I can. For example, uh, sorry, on these. Yeah, look at, look at these patterns, right, you know? Uh, some of these patterns uh, are even the code patterns in zebra, you know? We now know that the code patterns in many animals and, uh, and this kind of vegetation can both be explained by mechanisms such as uh, Turing instability, Turing patterns. So there is a lot of, there is there generality and there is uh, universality in the spatial pattern formation. Uh, but uh, but there are some also there are also some details that are important you know uh, you know certain additional uh, uh, parameters like strong positive feedback and the scale and the strength of positive feedback can confound these results. Therefore, I think one has to use a combination of um, uh, these mathemat general mathematical theories uh, together with the mechanistic. Approach. I think one has to use a combination uh, to sort of understand the limitations of universality here. I, I don't know if I answered your question well. Um, well, there is no sign from. Uh, yes, uh, is uh, uh, thanks you for the answer. So there is a question from Miguel Rodriguez, please. Yeah, uh, I, I I I'm thinking a little bit of the lack of data sets that you mentioned uh, to test the, this, uh, uh, these principles. And I, I was thinking if uh, maybe land covers superpose, like land cover maps superposed with uh, carbon sequestration maps could be used or that's just two cores uh, a resolution. Uh, because for both of them, there are contemporary distribution and also historical distributions uh, around wow. the globe. So, so, so I think for the, so I spoke about three types of spatial patterns, right? One is the first one being where you coarse grain so much that you don't know the spatial patterns anymore, right? The second one is there are very fine scale spatial patterns, you know? So those images I showed you, those were uh, patches over tens of meters of you know, approximately those scales. Um, uh, so the same with third one as well. The irregular patterns, they are also need to be observed on those scales. I think the first one can be done using some of the data sets we mentioned. Uh, you know, so those, you know, Landsat kind of data sets. Right. Which we, are, which we are currently working on as well. We are using a whole bunch of satellite-based vegetation metrics to not only look at the patterns of various uh, spatial metrics, but also can we construct model from data? Can we derive, you know, models from data as well? So we are also looking at those questions. But if you want to look at these, you know, fine scale spatial Turing like patterns, I, I, mean, I could be totally wrong. But you know, I think that the data sets that clearly show evidence for the theory are lacking right now. Thank you. Great, we have time for more questions. There, no, there, I think there are more questions on the chat box. Actually, I can see them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
There were a few questions about the null model. Uh, yeah. Yeah. About what is what okay. was what is the null model one without by stability? Yes, that's right. So the null model. Uh, so I don't know at what instant you asked me this question. So I think you were maybe referring to the null model in a, I had in one of those slides. So for example, what one can do is imagine that the density, the the let's say there is a, a huge spatial landscape, and you find that forty percent of the area is covered by trees, right? So sixty percent is bare ground now, right? So now how do I know it's driven by positive feedback? That's one case. So what one can do is. You can create a null model which maintains the same cover in the landscape, 40%, but you just randomize the distribution of the entire trees. So the clusters that will be formed in the randomized uh, uh, data set will be entirely not because of any interactions in ecology. They are entirely because of the density itself. So that's one way to arrive at null models for some of these kind of questions. Yes, that's right. So it will not have bistability. So it's just entirely. I made up the data, right? So, and, uh, so the second, uh, there's a question on what causes the sharp negative feedback. I think it's the Turing system, right? So you find that there's a, a positive feedback for short range, which becomes negative feedback for longer range. So what happens in these systems is that, uh, so for example, if these are clusters of trees, uh, so there is a, they draw water from neighboring regions. So they so the so the neighborhood of trees will have higher water retention. What that also means is that the slightly farther away from this cluster will be devoid of water. So the water is sort of conserved. If you were to think of water as conserved to some on very short time scales, so the rainfall falls homogeneously in the landscape. So there is a cluster of trees they not only retain locally well, they also draw water from the neighbors, local neighborhood. So because of which at slightly larger distances, there will be a lesser amount of water than the, uh, than the average. So that causes the negative feedback at this uh, slightly longer range uh, distances. Oh, somebody has answered the question, so it's great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yes, it's the beauty of the chat. So yeah. <laughs> this is another question by Zore, who is asking uh, uh, which, I mean, what does uh, feedback bifurcation mean in ecology, ecological modeling? I don't think I understood the question. Um, yeah. Yeah. What I said was the positive feedback can cause um, new types of bifurcations. So when we have a weak, when we have weak positive feedback, you have typically have continuous phase transitions or continuous transition from one state to other states. On the other hand, uh, uh, when you have strong positive feedback, uh, the transition can become abrupt. So that was what I was saying. I was not sure if I use the word feedback bifurcation though. Yeah. Uh, great. So we have, uh, if there are no more questions, I don't see any uh, hand raised. So um, great. So there will be uh, the last lecture by um, Visho on uh, Thursday. So two days from now. Yeah. I think you will have opportunity to ask uh, further question. Uh, now uh, 